We have a very interesting panel discussion now, a very important panel discussion, because um, one of the key elements of this annual meeting of the 50th anniversary is to take up again and to promote the notion of stakeholder capitalism. But of course, there are a number of issues related to stakeholder capitalism, which we want to discuss this evening. And I'm very pleased to, to have a very powerful panel. I'm um, not going necessarily um, uh, in the seating order, but I, I welcome um, Jim hagemann snabes the chairman of Siemens and of Maersk. Uh, he's also a member of the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum. Feike Sibesma, also a member of the board. He's chief executive and chairman of the managing board of Royal DSM. Then we have Mark Benioff, chairman and co-chief executive officer of Salesforce, member of the board of the World Economic Forum. Brian uh, Monian, uh, chairman and chief executive officer of the Bank of America and chair of the International Business Council of the World Economic Forum, and Gini Rometti, chairman and president and chief executive officer of IBM, uh, also a member of the International Business Council. And Gini, I would like to use this opportunity to express a special thanks to you, because uh, coming here to the 50th anniversary, I was looking again at our program, uh, which we had um, when we had the first meeting in 71. And uh, actually, your company is the first member of the forum um, and was represented already at the first meeting by one of its leading ex executives. And thank you thank for you. 50 years of loyalty. Um, highly appreciated. You're welcome, Klaus. Thank you. Now, Congratulations to you. Um, let me start with Brian. We, you had this afternoon, we had our um, meeting of the International Business Council, which you are chairing. And what is the outcome? You discussed very much how we can create a credible ESG system around the um, uh, around uh, stakeholder capitalism. So I think, Klaus, the, we had a session with the community of chair. Uh, persons this morning and then with the International Business Council today, really talking about two topics, which the simplest way to think about them, one is about what have we been doing to help make progress in SDGs, and that's the Lighthouse Projects, which are examples of what the companies have done under your leadership for the last 50 years to drive change. And the second is metrics to measure what we're going to do in the future. So what are we going to do in the future as companies to continue to drive stakeholder capitalism? And I think the, the idea here was to develop actual metrics that we could get the companies to agree to, meaning the operating companies, the investors who invest in us to agree to, and the owners who give them the assets to, to invest. So a pension fund giving the assets to an asset manager who then gives an assets to an operator. And get a set of metrics we can all agree to that are defining what stakeholder capitalism, capitalism is and importantly progress on it. And so the 100 or so uh, CEOs were there and 100 or so companies represented. Uh, a group of us have been working on this. We are now pushing it forward to syndicate it through the entire population for people to sign on. The context is 50 years ago, Klaus referenced that 50 plus years ago, the concept of stakeholder capitalism leading to 2017, the International Business Council and most of the members signing the compact, then leading to the next step, which was the uh, things like the BRT and the purpose of the corporation, what is it? Um, uh, and on top of that, the IBC saying that we have to make progress on the SDGs because if we don't, charity can't solve these problems, governments can't solve these problems alone. It will take the money from companies to generate the $6 trillion in investment to get the SDGs implemented. And the way companies are going to do that is by changing their operations, and the way society will measure them is by metrics. And so this vir virtuous circle of metrics, of operations to metrics to investors to owners and back to the metrics will allow us to sh demonstrate what stakeholder capitalism is effectively and and the group is uh, very enthusiastic and we've used the top four accounting firms uh, to help us drive it to have the integrity and auditability and and we'll push it through to the next summer's meeting so Brian, it was the beginning of a process when when do you feel 
we have a generally accepted comprehensive measurement system in place. Well, the goal is to do between now and August. Um, we started last. We started somewhat before last August, but really got into it last August in earnest with your team uh, from the WEF helping and drive through the industry. And I think to so the engagement, hopefully by the time we meet in Geneva in the yep. wonderful uh, location and at the WEF headquarters, we'll have a an agreed to set of metrics. And that way we can start publishing them as part of our annual reporting by the next subsequent year in 2021. And uh, we will present it uh, and try to integrate everybody on the occasion of the next annual meeting at yep. ours. And so th that'd be the arc to do it. And then, then thereafter yep. people can report. And I think, you know, simply this, this gives life to how to measure a company's progress towards serving all the stakeholders, doing a great job for its customers and clients and teammates and, and shareholders and doing a great job for society. And it's that and that's critical. So we move for it relatively fast because it's a compli complicated matter. Um, may I just ask the other panelists, uh, the sense of urgency, why is it necessary? Well, maybe I can add a, a comment there. I think it's, it's key. I mean, we are very good at measuring uh, shareholder value, and we've done that for many, many years. And as CEOs and chairmen, we think that is an important role. Now, if we want to go to stakeholder uh, capitalism, we do need to make sure that we can measure the value we create for all stakeholders. And there's so many measurements out there. So I'm very excited about the effort that Brian and the team has been doing. It nails it down to 22 measurements that everyone could implement. and. Uh, I can say as the chairman of Siemens, we have committed to engage in this project, help out, make sure that these metrics are relevant. And we're even putting our uh, remuneration system for the CEO uh, and, and the executive team uh, on an ESG base, uh, so stakeholder management and its core. And to add to Jim, uh, we should not only measure, of course, the different uh, things on sustainability, but it is clear that we are not adding enough value in the area of sustainability. If you look what's happening to the oceans, if you look what's happening to the climate, if you're looking happening to our scarce raw materials, it's clear that we need to measure, but it's also clear that the measurements will show that we're not doing enough yet. Yeah. Gini, we are living now in a very, I'm sorry. That, that's part of bringing the investment rate up to the need to actually get the SDGs implemented. Is, is if we all commit to these commitments, it will require more investment by Mars company, by Jim's company, by Ginny's company, and that's how we get there. That creates the urgency, the amount of commitment we make. Right now, it's just about a third of what we need. Ginny, we are, we are living in a, a new age, the age of the fourth industrial revolution, and actually you, you are one of the pioneers, uh, IBM, of, of this age. Now, this, uh, so those new technologies bring new challenges like platform companies and so on and so on. How does, how does uh, the fourth industrial revolution actually affect uh, stakeholder capitalism? Yes. Does it make it easier or more difficult? Uh, if you I look at data... I think for some things. companies it's going to make it more difficult and for others it will rely on the values they've held for a long time. And the reason I say that is, um, in some ways you'd say, would the fourth industrial revolution, industrial revolution change what we do? In some ways you'd say no, because when it comes to long-term and managing for the long-term and shareholder value, you'd say, why well, I've always put an and between every constituent. I do think there's a difference, though, with the fourth industrial revolution, and that it changes the nature of what we do. And I would boil it down to one word, and that's trust. And in fact, in many ways, I think this is going to be a decade of trust. And if you think about the technology, as you, know, you mentioned way back when we started all of this, even in the beginnings of AI, you could see the world would compete on data, and there would be good uses and bad uses of data. And then you would say to yourself, okay, if, people, if this era is going to thrive, people have to trust the technology. But one more thing, they have to trust that the era will be inclusive for them as well. And so I think this, this industrial revolution and everything about it bases itself in data and it calls the question then of trust at an individual level about the data, at a company level, at a nation level, and then does everyone feel the future is better or worse in this era? And, and that, that leads to you to change things if you focus on, on that point. So was the suggestion made that actually it should not be ESG, it should be ESGD? 
uh, with data playing such an important role. Uh, data responsibility should be emphasized. Well, look, I think for all of us, and um, Brian had four categories today as he went through on the metrics. Um, one of them was around principles and governance, and I think everybody could say, Klaus, I go back when you had me out here four or five years ago together, we introduced our, uh, I shouldn't say introduced, but we wrote them down, our principles about data and data management years ago around this to be clear that people knew that technology should augment man, that the data belonged to the owner, you had to be transparent, no bias, et cetera. So some of the things Brian is calling out to be measured on, you should be audited against those things if you believe them. The other big pillar you have is around people. And so if I can just kind of digress one second, I do think this era means 100% of jobs will change. We've been doing work with MIT and looking at how do job roles change. And you can already see tasks are moving to high end and low end. And some people will call that hollowing out the middle. And so it does call for massive retraining. And so I would just add, if I can, on this point to the fourth industrial revolution, the biggest thing that I think it requires is a change of paradigm around skills. For one, it's moving so quickly, you have to value skills, not just degrees. You have to have new education models and then new pathways to get people retrained and back into the workforce. So maybe we'll talk more about those programs, but those are very concrete actions that have to be taken. But what is the responsibility of a company like yours well, to act upon yeah. uh, those necessities? Okay, Th just... this is very. This is where I think there's this intersection between business and what is good for the shareholder, what's good for me, what's good for the community. Because if this, it is not good for anyone if people do not find the digital era to be an inclusive era where they see a better future for themselves. No one is going to buy new technologies. No one's going to want to go down these roads. If the world becomes more have and have not, that is a horrible thing, I believe. Both, and so, therefore, for us, I also need great employees. And so, that's part of my job. And I think because of the speed, I make this technology, I should usher it safely into the world. Part of ushering safely means I have to help the world prepare for it, and society prepare, and that means skills. And that's a public-private partnership. I mean, I was just sharing with the IBC earlier today, one of the ones uh, we've been passionate about for seven years was everyone can't have a college degree. So could you work with high schools around the world and turn them into with a community college or an apprenticeship, as others would call it, a vocational school, a six-year technology degree, a high school and an associate degree? To make a long story short, seven years later, 600 companies, 150,000 kids coming through, and they've got two degrees, they're employable, and the results show. So I would report on these metrics. Last year, 15, 1.5% of my hiring in the United States was these kids. And they're great employees, by the way, and they go back and get more education. And so I, but if we don't all participate, it's too much for government and the speed it's moving at is too fast and you've got to build trust in this era. Any comment on this issue of skills and the need for public-private Cooperation. I'll just relate it back to the, in the metrics, the people metric requires you to declare how you're handling this question of the fourth industrial revolution. So Ginny mentioned it, but this is the alignment of these issues that uh, my other colleagues will talk about and the fact that we can then commit to society will make progress. Now, if I can, um, there is uh, quite some uh, interrelationship between um, one issue we discuss with great urgency here, which is the environmental challenge which we have, and the stakeholder uh, capitalism. Do you see any, any interconnection, or um, does it provide a special sense of urgency? Right. Thanks, Klaus. And congratulations with 50 years stakeholder model. But after 50 years stakeholder model, we still need to discuss this area of sustainability and then I ask myself the question, are we all serving our economic model or did we develop the economic model which is serving mankind? And I think the economy ever started in a very simple sustainable model with barter trade, one specializes in this, the other specializes in this, and the exchange goods. And later on we made the economic model more complicated with money and gold and, and etc. 
And maybe somewhere we derailed a little bit that we thought making money is the real goal of the economy, where the real goal is to live happily here all together. And if we see how much problems we create with the oceans, with our climate, uh, with our scarce raw materials, we are somewhere derailing. And it is just good business sense as well to take care of your environment because nobody will remain successful in a world that falls apart, uh, societal, environmentally. So I think we can develop the products as businesses, we can develop the innovations to address the issues on climate. And that means also that we need to take uh, bigger steps. Uh, we need to be more clear as businesses what is our derivative of the Paris goals, so-called so science-based targets, to set our emission targets, maybe to put a price on carbon also internally in companies, at least to disclosure the climate-related financial risks we are taking, uh, all kinds of things which the three of us put in the letter to all the participants uh, of the forum. And I think there are many, many things is there which you can do as business to step up in order also to guarantee your own business model. So I would like to say, dare to think long-term, dare to address the SDGs, dare to take care of all the different stakeholders. On the long run, otherwise you will not remain successful. Brian, do you think that uh, the uh, environmental concerns have been sufficiently I ask a provocative question, sufficiently integrated into the scheme which we have now as a base. Yeah, I think if you look at one of the four pillars is Earth, and it has all the SDGs around environment, uh, the, the uh, clean water sanitation, the oceans, or light below water, and the words they use, the planet, et cetera. So they're all in there. The metrics we're using are really geared at, at showing how companies are managed in their scope one, scope two, scope two emissions, when they're going to be carbon free by. And the letter that you wrote with uh, Fiki and I asked people to make that commitment, about 20 odd percent of the 25% uh, or so of the companies have already made a commitment. So I think they're sufficiently detailed that they'll give measurements and then frankly, they'll give rel relative measurements. So one of the things will happen within an industry, if my company is doing X and another company is doing better than X, there'll be a natural competition to make sure I'm competitive, which will then cause me to do more. We at Bank America are carbon neutral now. We have a $300 billion environmental program. I think as people learn more about that, we just created a new markets committee with Anne Fanuk and Tom Montag to lead help driving a business case. As people hear more about that, you're going to see more people do it, even smaller size banks, et cetera. Brian, we have, uh, under your leadership, the um, Business Council developed this framework. Um, I think we should uh, distribute this framework to everybody here uh, and to integrate now everybody into this, um, uh, let's say, um, yeah, mobilization of, of all businesses. Um, any comment? Um, well, it is not only for us companies, but it is also for those who invest in us asset managers or behind them asset owners they also find it very difficult to see which company is now really sustainable and which company not. There are more than 650 different matrices out there to determine who is sustainable. Now, nobody understands out of 650 different matrices who's now really sustainable and how you compare companies. It's for us companies important, it's for investors important, it is for society at large important. And that is what Brian and together with the IBC tried to do in the past months and in the coming months to converge that to a much more clear set. This is sustainable, this is not sustainable, this is the way you measure. And I think that transparency, Klaus, fits 100% with the stakeholder model. So we start here a true revolution. We do. Yeah. Mm. Now, uh, Jim, you as the chairman of Siemens, you, you had just uh, to make some difficult decisions and um, uh, even when you adhere to the stakeholder concept, you cannot avoid that at certain moments you have to take the decision in one way or another way and to find the right balance. What is your experience and your advice? Um, yeah, so we, you're right. We had a pretty um, challenging situation recently. Um, and it was uh, challenging in many ways. It was uh, emotional because um, 
um, of the, uh, let's say, lack of fact uh, in the conversation around it. And it was super complex. So with, with the um, uh, social media and the spread of information that we have today, you suddenly find yourself in a very defensive moment when, when actually in your core you feel that, you know, pretty proud of where the company is and w where it's going. I mean, the, the factual situation which makes me proud of Siemens is that Siemens was one of the first industrial players who actually committed to CO2 neutrality. Uh, we did that in 2015. Uh, so that's five years ago and said by 30 we'll be neutral and by 20, this is this year, we'll have a 50% reduction of CO2 compared to 14. So very committed to that. We, we changed our philosophy as well to say, well, you know, being uh, stakeholder oriented and planet oriented is not about, uh, you know, how you spend your money, i.e. we make business, we make a profit, and then how much of this profit will we do good <coughs> for? We actually turn it around and say it's about how we make our money. And fact is that today, 44% of the total revenue of, of Siemens, which is a, what, 82 billion euro company, is associated with uh, solutions that help our customers run their business in a more sustainable way. And, and so with that in mind, you feel proud about where the company is, and then suddenly you find yourself in a, a communication crisis because we had uh, committed to deliver a signaling system to a train, and the train moves coal from a coal mine. And, and, and you look at that, you feel you're pretty far away from the, the bad doing, uh, but we had committed to this project and suddenly, uh, you know, if you follow then the media and the headlines, the headline says, you know, Siemens is building coal mines, which, which is not factually true, and, but it's really hard to deal with that situation. Um, and you've got to make some choices. Are we still going to deliver that system? It's not a big contract. You, you know, you want to value commitments to customers. Um, for me, this case shows that, first of all, there is a, an urgency on this, where your permission to play as a company, even though you feel you're doing the right things, can be taken away from you instantly uh, in a place where you didn't expect it. And, and secondly, I believe that we are right now at the tipping point where the scrutiny around projects that are not relevant for that future, a fossil free future, will be dramatically increasing. The climate change is not some topic we can talk about, it's about real action. And, and you've got to realize that as a company and you've got to take real action. The, the issue is not the commitment to the future that you want to bring your company to, but the transition to get there. You don't get there in one day. We have 15 years when we started this, now we have 10 left. We're doing fine, but we need to basically re, re, uh, reinvent the company, go from solutions that were fossil based to renewable based. You gotta reskill the company, you gotta restructure the company, get out of certain businesses so that you can invest in others, and you do need to reposition the company because otherwise you suddenly find yourself in the wrong headline even though you're doing the right thing. So, as a chairman, for me, it's about not getting distracted by this because you've got to do the right things. But if anything, you need to talk more about it and you need to accelerate your efforts. Otherwise, any little project, even though you feel you're far away from the wrongdoing, can distract you and reduce your ability to become what you have intended to be. Jenny, you, you were very much nodding in your head. Um, yes. You have your own experience, and can you tell yeah, about yeah, Yes, I do, and I mean, it's, it's had to do with whether or not we take on certain projects, as an example. There's much discussion about different technologies and how they're used, and I think that those have to be values-based decisions, but what's changed is how much you have to talk about it so that people understand why you take these decisions. And I think it's even what's surrounded this whole dialogue around the purpose of a corporation, that there's been things that are vi written very binary about the topic. And this isn't a binary topic. And if you manage for the long term, you do have an and between all of these words, yet people want to polarize this. So it, when any one of us do things for our community, our employees, our clients, the countries everywhere within which we live, our partners, I always feel they give us license to operate, 
that is where our license to operate comes from. So that communication that Jim was talking about, A, it is both important to have it, but it's also because it is good for your business. This is, a, is not an altruistic thing that you are doing in and of itself. And I think you can't, in this day and age, explain that enough or give the rationale. I mean, when I say I do, when people will say, well, this is charity or foundation work, I say, no, it's not. I mean, skills is not charity and foundation work. And if living in a democracy that people think they have a better future is not charity work because they are your employees and your customers. So that's why I was really understanding and agreeing with this point that I think um, it's just so important to both position everything right and connect those dots, right? Because it's a virtuous circle, but you got to get, get it moving. Brian? And so the, one of the setups that we did with the groups today was to talk about the six trillion and the charity is eight, 800 billion a year. You have a government, the biggest government in the United States has a billion, trillion dollar deficit and is only a four trillion dollar budget. So this work can't be charity. It's what Jim said, it is retooling your business system to have the outcome. Otherwise, we're gonna fail because we're, we have 800 billion a year and we have six trillion of demand and it's not gonna come close. Yeah. And that's if you took all the money and all the charity in the world only went to this items and there's the arts and a lot of other things which are not, uh, you know, are also included. So this idea, what Jim is saying, is we're saying to operate your whole expense base, your whole customer base, your whole supply chain, and over time transition to produce these results is a much more sustainable, sustainable process. Mark, I will, I will ask you in a moment a very um, a sensitive question. But before coming back to you, Chini, um, if you want to judge the behavior of a company, you have to have ethical principles. Now, you have to have the principles. principles. And now, you are uh, a leader in one of the foremost leaders in artificial intelligence. And there are new technologies where we haven't succeeded yet to create the ethical framework around. How do you deal with those issues? Yeah, look, I, this is a topic that we took up many years ago. First, principles always start with yourself before you try to put them on other people. And to this day, we've written ethical principles for AI. So within my own company, it starts with, because I build this stuff, the belief that it's there to augment what you and I do and make us better. That, that does matter where you start from and how you start building these things. And then the part that you must be transparent and you must be sure it's rid of bias and it has to be explainable. So once you start laying out what your principles are for this and then audit yourself to them. So I think there are some pretty simple things we do and many people can do. Things like do not hide your AI. You should know when you're interacting with it versus just a system. There are things like you should check it for bias I mean, we've built products that actually can, it doesn't matter who built your AI, it can tell you if it has bias. And an important sort of footnote, like what is bias? Because the actual act of concluding bias is bias. You, you've had some set of values that you've determined this is good and this is bad. And so that's culturally different. It varies in many places. So what our tools really look for are just patterns. And then you have to put them against the values. It's a values question, not a technology question, right? And so you would don't hide it, test it all the time. I think when it comes to regulation and a framework to deal with AI, you should deal with how it's used, not try to, not the technology and uh, regulate it itself. It takes precision regulation. And then above that, if I'm a company, we have an AI ethics officer. I think you guys do too, as I, I mean, I think many of us do now. So then we've worked with all countries around the world. Europe has come out with one. OECD's got one. A number of these have been built that um, I think have been built quite sensibly in partnership with, with business and industry and academia to give them input because there is always going to be this balance between innovation and whether it be privacy or security or any other path you go down. And in these early stages, you really do want to both watch its use, also regulate it based on risk, and be sure you're transparent. So that's, I, I think it's an incredibly important thing, and it isn't just something a government does. Every company has to do it for themselves. Mark, um, you have been a proponent and uh, 
a fabulous partner uh, in promoting the stakeholder concept. Thank you, because Thank you. Uh, you are a role model. But you went even one step further. And um, what you did is actually to speak out on social issues uh, in a very um, strong way. Uh, so you took a position, for example, in addressing poverty in your community in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, you even were involved in a um, voting um, uh, dispute. Um, and of course, uh, your support for LGBTQ rights. Um, now, my question is, should a uh, business leader not only um, apply or submit himself uh, to the uh, ESG um, standards, but even go one step further and speak out on political issues. Mm. Well, Klaus, I mean, just listening to this panel and being here at the conference uh, in recent events, certainly I would tell you, uh, and I would certainly tell the business leaders here that capitalism as we have known it is dead. And this obsession that we have with maximizing profits for shareholders alone has led to incredible inequality and a planetary emergency. Uh, we all owe a grat of gratitude to you, Klaus. Uh, you have shown us the way forward. And Klaus is right. For 50 years, we have seen he has called for a new capitalism, a stakeholder capitalism a more fair, a more just, a more equitable, a more sustainable way of doing business that values all stakeholders as well as all shareholders. And I know, Klaus, you are right because Salesforce and through your mentorship is living proof that stakeholder capitalism works. Now, you know we've had a phenomenal return for our shareholders. Uh, $165 billion in market capitalization 4,000% return since we went public in 2004. But Klaus, we've also had a very good return for our stakeholders. 310 million in grants so far to worthy causes. Our employees have volunteered four and a half million hours uh, to their local communities. 45,000 nonprofits and NGOs, including the World Economic Forum, use our product for free. And that's about a billion dollars of our software a year as well. And it's why, Klaus, I so strongly believe that when we serve all stakeholders, business is the greatest platform for change. And the great news is, and I believe that you can see it here, that stakeholder capitalism is finally hitting a tipping point. In the U.S., the Business Roundtable has stated now the purpose of a corporation includes a fundamental commitment to all stakeholders, not just its shareholders, that choosing between the two is a false choice. And this Mon Davos Manifesto 2020 that you have written says that the purpose of a company in the fourth industrial revolution is to create a value for all its stakeholders. So taking that all into my heart when you say does it mean then that I have to fight for my employees? Yes. So if they're being discriminated against and if they're LGBTQ employees, yes, we will fight for them. Does it mean that I have to fight for our customers? Of course. Or even our local stakeholders in our community like our homeless. Yes, every CEO has a responsibility to think about all stakeholders. And yes, as you've seen aggressively at this conference, the planet is a key stakeholder. We are in a planetary emergency. That is why I commend you, Klaus, for 1T.org, calling for the planting of one trillion trees to sequester over 200 gigatons of carbon and calling on the governments that have spoken here, the businesses that have spoken here, the NGOs that have spoken here, to take immediate action to one, yes, be net zero. Reduce your emission, but two, also, we need to sequester the carbon that has been transferred from the grounds and from the oceans and from the trees into the atmosphere. 
So anyway, I want to thank you, Klaus, for leading us to this vision of stakeholder capitalism that we are today. And you certainly deserve a tremendous uh, accommodation for 50 years of this vision. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mark. We are coming to an end of uh, the session. Um, would you, I, I have the feeling we are here at a funeral. Uh, it's a funeral of uh, shareholder capitalism, and it's a birth of uh, stakeholder capitalism. Now, to conclude um, this um, panel discussion, um, what would be your advice now to the audience? I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are still people who are skeptical about this uh, transformation. What, what is your message to, to people who are skeptical um, and still have uh, question marks in their mind? Jamie, well, do you I, want to start? Or? Sure, sure, I can oh, do go it. Ahead. So for me, um, as a business leader, um, I had an epiphany uh, in 2008 when uh, I went on a trip to India and, and met some of the poorest people on the planet and some of the richest people on the planet the same day. And uh, I almost resigned and said, I'm going to you know, spend time to do something good for the world. And I realized uh, a few hours later that if I stayed in business and I could leverage the vehicle of business, then probably I would have a significantly more impact than I would just have as uh, Jim Hagerman Snava, who cares about me. Uh, at the time, I was with SAP. And, and uh, we began a process of trying to redirect the company. Uh, towards uh, a stakeholder orientation that led not only to a doubling of the value of the company, but actually an excitement inside the company about what this company could do. I'm seeing the same now with Siemens. Um, I see the same with AP Miller Mask. So in my mind, we often underestimate the power that business can have. You ask, should we be polit political? No, I don't think so. We should influence policies to create frameworks that align better the stakeholders. But it is uh, not our duty to, to be political. I think we need to have opinions. And most of all, we need to leverage the global reach of our companies, the, the integration that we have with employees and the, in societies in which we operate, and demonstrate action, because that's what business is really good at. And, and I hope that everyone will sign the manifest. Uh, I certainly will, because I also think it's completely unfair that one CEO is asked to take responsibility for some other CEO who's not getting it done. And therefore, my plea to everyone, yeah. sign it and then do something. Be a force, because business can be. Thank you. Mark? Do you want well, to Klaus, I, I think that you know, there's been some comments made about corporate cultures. But I think that we realize that a corporate culture alone will not be enough to meet the urgency and scale of today's global challenges. We need new resources. The wealthiest among us, people like me and so many of us here, we need to pay higher taxes. That's a word that has not been used yet on the panel. And I'm pleased that your Davos Manifesto, Klaus, recognizes that companies need to pay higher taxes and pay their fair share. And one example of that is how we're addressing this at Salesforce in San Francisco, where we radically supported a new tax on our largest companies to address our homelessness crisis because that homeless are stakeholders, as I mentioned. But you asked, what should we be doing now as business leaders? And I would tell my fellow business leaders here that none of these challenges are going away. We need to rise to this moment of urgency. We need to act now. If you're attending this conference, you need to commit to stakeholder capitalism. If you are attending this conference, you need to commit to being net zero. If you're attending this conference, you need to help to protect the oceans. If you're attending this conference, you need to commit to help planting one trillion trees. Every single one of us is a platform for change. This is a time of action, not words. We are at that point of urgency with our planet. And that's why I wrote the book Trailblazer. Because I believe that my business, and really all of us, are tremendous platforms for change. 
and that we must act today. Thank you. So the question, the skeptic might say, can you do both? Can you really deliver for all the constituencies? Can you deliver for your customers? Can you deliver for your employees? Can you deliver for your shareholders and deliver for society? And we, we've looked back and back tested this in a lot of ways in our research. Just pure matter, the BRT uh, firms that signed the BRT have outperformed their industry. If you, our research team has proven that if you don't follow good SGS principles, you, you could look back and if you were an investor, if you didn't invest in those companies that performed poorly, you'd miss 90% of the bankruptcies. Our research team has declared the next decade one of the 10 trends is moral capitalism, and that's where the investor money is going to flow. So if you're thinking about you can produce a profit, if you're a shareholder and not address your owners and not address your employees, you're going to have a problem. But I'd flip it around and be more optimistic. You can do both. Our company has been able to, across the decade I've been CEO, generate tremendous shareholder return, re earn record earnings, Two and a half billion of charity, fifty billion dollars of community development, going to complete uh, completed one hundred twenty-five billion dollars plus of environmental financings, and you can do it while we we're making money. These are all business propositions. So I think the skeptics say you can't do both. You can. Now let's go out and do it. Mike. Well, I hope it's not a funeral. Uh, although it's always good to bury the things we we don't need anymore, yeah. but I hope it's more a burst. Uh, a burst of taking care, like nice. Mark is saying, of all the different stakeholders. Globalization brought prosperity for billions of people, for many countries, but not for all countries, and not for all people in all countries, including the planet being one of those stakeholders uh, of globalization. And I think what we should do, my advice, I am deeply convinced that you can serve all stakeholders, that you can serve the planet, that you can serve society and create profit. However, not always on the short term, not. So what should we do? We should resist the temptation of being seduced to deliver value only on the short term. And it is sometimes tempting to do that, but we should resist that temptation and go for the long term and if you go for the long term, I'm convinced that you can combine value creation in an economic sense together with societal value and ecological value. And that is what we CEOs, what we businesses need to do. Jimmy, you have the last word. Yeah, well, that's a tough position. I, I think everyone's done a great job and uh, I'm always humble about advice because I need more advice than I probably give. So I think the only thing I would add to this conversation then is IBM's in its second century. So I think this is living proof that if you do honor all stakeholders, as I said earlier, it is your license to operate. And one thing I had to think hard though in this new era, I'll end where, where Klaus, your first question to me was on the fourth industrial revolution. And there is something different though here now. And I think the world is bifurcating between what I called simply talking to my workforce seven, eight years ago to the team, I said the world was bifurcating into good tech and bad tech. And I think you have to decide what of those you are. And if you're good tech, what does that really mean? And I don't mean a quote technology company. I mean good tech or bad tech and how you're going to use it. And for us, we made a decision that it would be about things like everything we did would build trust. It would be to prepare society and their skills. We would be the industry's role model for diversity and inclusion and honor the planet. And that's what that means. And my own, my would end on that advice to just decide what that means for you to be on the good side of history. Thank you all the panelists. And um, you see why we feel that this annual meeting um, and the Manifesto 2020 should really be a um, turning point uh, from one thinking to a new thinking. Yeah. And you have seen with the panelists uh, the passion which is behind. Um, because we are dealing here not with a theoretical issue, I think we are dealing here with an issue which will determine the survival of the free enterprise system of democracy if we take it in a broader context. Uh, so um, let's take up the challenge and please thank the panelists.